very nice to meet you. So my name is Ashwin. I'm from the Oxford Alpha Fund, and I'm here with the co-president Saket, also from the Oxford Alpha Fund. And so, you know, so I mean, at OAF, we are a premier student investment society here at Oxford. We mainly focus on fundamental investing, and that's I guess exactly what Monish does as well, and what he's so good at. So maybe let's start right from the very beginning. So. What really got you into investing? And given your background, when did you get started and how did you get started? Yeah, so my entry into the world of investments was kind of accidental. I am an engineer by training and I didn't, I wasn't working in the industry or anything like that. I was ru running a IT services system integration firm about 29 years ago. And, and I accidentally heard about Warren Buffett for the first time. I was actually reading a Peter Lynch book, and which I found really interesting. And then he was talking about this guy Buffett in very reverential terms. And I didn't know who, who Warren was. And I was lucky the first couple of biographies on him had come out, which were great to read. And then I got my hands on the Berkshire letters and then the partnership letters and basically opened up a big new world for me. And as an outsider looking into the industry at that time, I made some observations which I found very peculiar. One of the one of the observations I made is that the the way that Warren Buffett invested and suggested that people follow investing was quite different from the way I saw professional mutual fund investors invest. So the mutual fund would have hundreds of positions, they would have 80% turnover in a year. And like the first, you know, the premise of, of Buffett is that you're not investing in a stock, you're buying a fraction of a business and to not over diversify and so on. And their results, the mutual fund results reflected that kind of, uh, you know, non-adherence to what I call the basic principles of uh, value investing. And so I had a I had a theory at that time that if some village idiot like me uh, basically invested using Buffett's approach, the village idiot should do better than most of the professionals because the professionals clearly were violating basically what I would call the laws of investing or the laws of physics. And, but you know, a notion like that doesn't have much value without execution behind it. So I was lucky. I had a sale of some assets in my business for the first time. I had some money. I had a million dollars to basically, which I didn't need, I could put into the equity markets. And I basically said, okay, we're going to invest this million in what I call basically a 10 by 10 portfolio, 10 stocks. We're going to see what the results are because that's where the rubber meets the road. And this was in 94, 95. And then I think by around early 2000, the million was north of 13 million. And well done, Monish, well done. <laughs> and, and it was, I don't know, like 70% there or something. So it worked wildly better than I expected. It definitely did better than the so-called professionals. And I was off to the races from there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that sounds amazing. And in fact, I had a similar story too. I mean, I transformed from Buffett among the, the philosophy, you know, thinking about it as a business rather than as a stock. And I think that's just so appealing and it makes so much sense. Don't you agree? And that's kind of how we think about it at OAF as well. And I think Saket is going to jump in with our next kind of our next segue of questions. But thank you. That was really interesting. Sure. Yeah, so a bit more about Buffett and Munger. The concept of circle of competence is particularly important. How have you worked to expand that over years of investing? And how would you recommend other investors go about doing that for themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, we would we would all start out with a very small uh, circle of competence. Usually, usually probably the best area to that we likely have some competence is products and services that we are consuming. You know, those are probably the most likely candidates of businesses that might be the easiest for us to understand. I don't, I've never paid much attention to or tried to expand the circle. I think that kind of happens by osmosis. And uh, I don't think one should really even be trying to make the circle wider. It, it will naturally get wider if you have 
a diversified set of interests. And if you are, you know, seeker or what Munger would call worldly wisdom. So I think that will, and you have, if you have a curiosity about different things, then the, the circle kind of naturally expands as you go along. But the size of the circle is not really correlated with investment success. So, and we see that all over the place. So if you look at any successful entrepreneur, they may be really good at their business, but they may not know anything about anything else. But just knowing enough about their business or their industry is sufficient for them to do quite well. And Munger talks about this friend of his, and he passed away, I think, a couple of years ago, John Ariega. He was a billionaire, lived in the Bay Area. And he was a real estate investor, and he only invested in properties within a mile of the Stanford University campus. Not the Bay Area, not California, not the United States, just that one mile radius around the Stanford campus. And he did incredibly well. And if, if you would have walked with him around the perimeter of the campus, he could pretty much tell you everything about every building, you know, what the rents were, what the last time it was sold for, what it's worth, all these things. And basically, John Ariega was selling off a lot of his properties when things got euphoric. And he would buy them all back and others beyond that when things got overly pessimistic. Uh, but he never drifted away from his circle of competence and, and interestingly, Mark Andreessen, you know, of, of Andreessen Horowitz and Netscape fame, dated and subsequently married Ariega's daughter. And so that's like billionaire to the power of billionaire, you know. And so anyway, I think, I think to me, the Ariega model is the model to follow, which is basically, it's better to be an inch wide and a mile deep than to be a mile wide and an inch deep. So the deeper you can go into now, of course, the issue is that you can go into a rabbit hole, which may not yield a lot of riches. So there's an art to knowing which rabbit holes to go down. But if you, if you go down a rabbit hole with a rich vein of opportunity, you don't need too many rabbit holes and uh, you'll do extremely well. Well, I completely agree. I think Nick Sleep, when he closed his portfolio, he only had three stocks and two of them had really similar models. And I think you, you're also friends and correspond with Nick as well. So this Yeah, is yeah, Nick's a good friend. Yes. But maybe how did you meet Nick and like, how was your kind of relationship developed? I know he's quite a private person as well. In fact, I've reached out to him in the past, but like, maybe you could talk a bit about that as well. Yeah. Nick is private with everyone except me. Wow. <laughs> uh, well, actually, Nick, Nick's, Nick's been a friend of Guy Steer for a long time. And I'm trying to remember, I'm not exactly sure how Guy and uh, Nick met, whether they met at Berkshire or what happened. But through Guy, I got to know Nick. And I always enjoyed um, meeting and interacting with Nick. And, uh, and, uh, and basically, you know, uh, over time, uh, got to know him a bit better. But no, I, I mean, to... To put jokes aside, he continues to be a private person. Even with me, he's quite private. But the kimono does open a little bit more, so that's okay. But yeah, I mean, I think I think I think Nick uh, Nick had a very simple model with him and his partner Case, and they basically would come into the office. And Case didn't even have a desk to work on; he had a big kind of lazy boy type chair, and mm -hmm. he just spent his day. They both spent their day reading annual reports, and you know, the Amazon annual report jumped out at them. And of course, the Berkshire Annual Report jumps out at all of us. And they went deep into the Amazon rabbit hole and figured out a few things that the rest of us could not figure out. And the rest is history. Yes, yes. I mean, completely agree. I mean, I've been, I've read his letters. I can't even count the number of times and I was so inspired by it. I just learned so much from it. Every time you read them again, you learn something new. You see something new. And I just thought it's a really great gift that he shared it with everyone through the foundation. And I think himself, like yourself, the charitable work that you guys do is really, really commendable. And here at OF, we really appreciate that, of course. And it's great, really great, great role models. 
Um, kind of touching on that idea a bit more about going to the rabbit hole and digging deeper. So that kind of comes to the idea of portfolio concentration and, you know, running a more concentrated set of ideas. But you always run the risk of, I guess, getting it wrong. Like, let's say with Valiant in 2015 to 20, like 2016, lots of big investors were highly concentrated there. And then how, in, let's say in your experience, how would you kind of know when, you know, this concentration and this digging into the rabbit hole is the wrong hole and it's time for you to switch and get out and, you know, stop digging? Yeah, so I think that, I think it was John Templeton who said that, Sir John Templeton who said that basically the very best investment analysts would be wrong one out of three times. And more likely, most of us would be wrong half the time. And so the investing business is an extremely forgiving business. If, if you ran a, a 10 stock portfolio and you were wrong about half the stocks, which is probably what you should expect would happen, about half the stocks, what you expect is going to happen to those businesses. Is, uh, you know, we're looking into the future. And when we're looking into the future, by definition, that's, you know, fraught with peril. So what, what John Templeton defined as a mistake might be that the stock sidelines, the stock goes down, the stock goes to zero, the stock goes up 10%, whether when you thought it would double, all of these things are mistakes. But because of the asymmetry of the way the investing business works with risk and reward, you know, an investor could be extremely successful and do extremely well, even if they were, were right one out of 10 times. If that one time when they were right was just a massive home run, it would take care of all the mistakes. And so I think that the way I look at it is that if I ran a if I run a 10 stock portfolio and one of those 10 stocks happens to be valiant, and I've had I've had several zeros in my illustrious career. And so the zeros are gonna happen. You know, I mean, I learned a few ways to try to reduce the zeros, but the zeros will happen. And so, you know, one stock goes to zero you're down 10% because of that, it's not the end of the world. And so even the investors, I think, who were long on Valiant, I don't know if they had really put more than 10% of assets into Valiant. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but they had had a huge run up in the value of Valiant. So like in, in places like the Sequoia Fund, it became maybe 30% of the pie and so on. So, you know, that's, you're giving up gains, which is a little bit different than putting 30% up. So I, I wouldn't sweat the fact that we are going to have mistakes. I, I don't think there's any way to avoid them. Even Buffett this year in his letter said that basically 12 decisions over 58 years created Berkshire as we know it. And he, he would have made hundreds of decisions. So even his hit rate of the great ones was like something like less than 4%. And so I, I don't think we need to be too concerned. I think what we need to do is focus on our circle of competence, stay as close to the center as possible, don't wander to the edges and definitely don't wander off beyond the edges and don't overly concentrate. I think 10 stocks, eight stocks is perfectly fine. Three stocks may not be so fine. And, and I think you'll be fine. Yeah, that, we think that, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, the... The idea of really knowing where you are. And that asymmetry, I guess, is really important. You talk about it with shorting as well, right? Shorting is the asymmetry, but the wrong way around. Yeah. You, yes. guess, you can lose as much as you want, but you only make 100%. And Mr. Yeah. Chanos just shut down his shop. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of the best short sales of all time. And it's like, I have to pack up. Yeah. And he's, he's actually extremely good. He's an extremely yeah. good forensic accountant. Uh, many of the times, the things that he pointed out, in businesses, he was right. I mean, it's, sometimes it's hard to get the timing right and it can go against you and all kinds of other things, so. Yeah, no, completely agree. Kind of, we were thinking, because we were talking a little, you know, about shorting and also about concentration. And I guess both Buffett, Nick Sleep, so many people, they emphasize the importance of management. I guess when you're a concentrated portfolio, you're really delegating your investment to management and they have to run it. And we try to spend a lot of time thinking about that too. So how do you also incorporate assessing, assessing management in the investment process? Are there maybe some 
key ways that you look to kind of invest, kind of assess management teams, key things that you look out for, and maybe other, maybe also if we invert, are there key red flags as well that you would say, no, if it's like this, I would definitely not invest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the simplest way to assess management is to look at the track record. So do not focus on what they're telling you they're going to do. Go back and look at what they've done and go further back and look at what they said they would do and then what transpired after that. So do they underpromise and overdeliver or overpromise and underdeliver? And so I think that if we had the luxury of looking at long histories of a given management team or a given CEO, it it will become relatively obvious where the individual stands and how they think and what's what's going on on that front the other the other thing to also be uh, cognizant of is that we want to look at the business quality as well so we can have a situation where management is exceptional but the moat is mediocre and then that's not so good so ideally uh, we would have a business where the moat is incredible and overlaid on top of the moat is great management. But I think, like I said, if you if you go down the rabbit hole, if you go a mile deep and all of that, I think you're going to be able to separate the wheat from the shaft. And I think you'll know exactly what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think maybe if we could touch on that a bit more, the idea of the track record. So maybe you have companies like, let's say, Transdive, where the management team is so important to business and acquiring, but yet... How would you get confidence in the management team at Transline when they just come public and you do, you do you can't really see that track long track record? Yeah, I'm sorry. What company did you mention? Transline, uh, Nick, Nick Howley's uh, company. Yeah, I've never spent a lot of time looking at Transline, and I I remember I had a I I had a conversation or maybe I read somewhere about Chuck Akery. And Chuck Akery had looked at Transdime and he took a pass on the business. And the reason he took a pass on the business was that he said that the management team was incented with stock options and restricted stock. And as soon as those became exercisable, they would exercise and sell those positions. So one of Chuck Akery's business models, I mean, I think his mental models was that he wanted management with skin in the game where there was large ownership. So he saw a situation here where Transdime had done really well over the years. The management team would have done even better if they'd held the stock, but they didn't hold the stock, right? So his perspective was, well, I can't really be, you know, in ownership with these guys who are not co-invested with me, right? And in in reality, the way it's worked out, I think that in Transtime's case, it has worked in spite of that. So what I'm saying is that that's a good mental model for Chuck AP to have used, but sometimes it can lead you astray, right? And that's an example of where the business has continued to do well. And I think part of that happened with Transtime because Transtime had private equity roots. So basically, there was one set of private equity players which funded a team to go to, to do a bunch of acquisitions. Then they took the company, I think they took it public or they sold it to another private equity player. And, and then after that, they went public. I think there were like a couple of different players that had come in. And so the leaders at Transdime were kind of very used to the shareholders coming in, <laughs> making a bunch of money and then exiting. And so they kind of adopted the same, the same philosophy for good or bad. And if you look at if you look at most companies where you know people are not holding stock and they're you know doing that sort of behavior, it's usually a red flag. So Chuck was correct in 99% of cases. But you know, you miss some. But the good news about this business is, in in baseball terms, there's no call strikes, and and so you miss one. And 
you know, I looked at Transdime briefly. I didn't see that it was a PE of one and I moved on, you know. You know, it wasn't even a PE of two or three or four. And I, you know, after that, it just becomes too expensive for me. So there's lots of stuff I let go wrongly because optically it appears expensive when in reality it isn't. And Amazon's a good example of that. You know, I always looked at it. I always said, where's the earnings? And I couldn't see it, but Nick could see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess those are the ones that get away. But when you have, yeah. when you have these models and ideas, some will get away, but you get the others. And the no, absolutely, yeah. Them, right, as Buffett says, I think he's exactly right. So we'll kind of segue to the second part and kind of follow up a bit more on some of the um, previous conversations we had uh, with the OF as well. And Sakesh is going to take uh, most of that. So thank you very much, Manish. All right. Hey, so the first question we have in following up uh, regarding our previous conversation is about racist logistics, right? So in our previous conversation, you talked about looking for markets where people are rushing to exit, such as in Turkey, and sort of that was the, the racist example. On the flip side, how would you approach markets where all investors are rushing in, for example, Japan this year? Like I said in the previous section that, you know, this is a business where there's no call strikes. So if, if we don't find obvious value, we don't need to do anything. Now, Japan, Japan may not be overvalued or overheated or any of those things. It's been, you know, flatlined and declining for so long. And Japanese companies still screen cheap. They screen very cheap. But I think there are a few challenges that come up in Japan. The first is a demographic challenge you know, a, a declining population is a significant headwind. So if I were looking at companies in Japan, I would want to look at businesses whose fortunes and revenues were tied to exports outside Japan versus the domestic market. I would just think that that's a better place. And when Buffett bought the Japanese trading companies, the five Japanese trading companies in 2020, uh, a large portion of their footprint is outside Japan. I mean, their capital allocators all over the world and so in that particular case, the demographic doesn't really affect you because you're basically allocating capital in the world and it's, it's perfectly fine. The second issue that's been a, a bigger concern for Japanese companies is that the cash and the resources that the company has at its disposal, a lot of Japanese companies believe is for the benefit of the employees. So lifetime employment is very important. Not laying off people is very important. Being able to ride out economic storms is very important. And some of those principles will negatively affect shareholder returns. So if a business is bloated, I mean, it's a, it's a great business, but it's carrying two times the number of employees that it should be carrying, that helps the that hurts the providers of capital. And I, I think there's a lot of Japanese management teams who view their primary responsibility not towards the shareholders, but towards the employees. And that's perfectly fine. But I think when you see that, you have to handicap that. And, and you have to say, okay, even with this headwind, can I still do well? So my take is that you know, one doesn't need to follow flavor of the day and one doesn't need to follow the crowd. In fact, one should not follow the crowd. Just because Japan's gone up this year significantly, the Japanese market's gone up this year, in itself doesn't tell me much. I think it, it boils down to individual businesses and the future of those businesses. So I would look at businesses where the the revenues and growth was tied to things happening outside Japan. And I would look at uh, management teams which were focused on shareholder value as their primary driver. And, and then I would look at quality of business and all of the other things, quality of management, and see if there's uh, meat on the bone and things that we can do. On the other hand, there are markets like Turkey, which are liking, uh, like shooting fish in a barrel after all the water has been run out, you know? So I like to walk over six inch bars 
rather than jump over seven foot high bars. Yeah, speaking a little bit more about kind of avoiding the crowds. In our last conversation, you talked a lot about the process of cloning great ideas from uh, other great colleagues in the investment space. How do you square up kind of cloning and seeking inspiration from others versus the risk of kind of momentum trading, piling into trades, and kind of pursuing undifferentiated ideas? We've seen examples like Alibaba recently. Yeah. Well, like I said, we, we, we will make mistakes and it's just part of the landscape. I think that in general, if you, it, it's, it's perfectly fine to source ideas from anywhere. It's perfectly fine to source them from smart investors. We, we should also understand that those smart investors are also going to be wrong half the time. So <laughs> that's uh, wrong half the time is not just us, it's going to be everyone. And, and, and yeah, we are not going to be batting 100%. I mean, Alibaba is a good example of a business that had and probably still has very wide and deep moats, but they had events take place that were hard to predict. And then they kind of got on the wrong side of the Chinese government and, you know, we went from there. So it's been a lot of unraveling that's taken place there, which, you know, if you looked at the business five years ago or something, you wouldn't have been able to forecast that that would be the trajectory this business would take. And that's that's fine. It's the nature of investing that there are uncertainties and they were not, we're not going to always be able to get it right. I think that just is is one of those things where and and even when I when I look at a, a business like Resas, for example, you know, I, I had no idea and I still have no idea at what point the market will recognize the real value of the business and ascribe that value to it. It's the market's increased the value of the business a lot since we bought it, but it still trades at a big, big discount. And I have no idea when that discount will close, but you know, we just kind of place our bets, make some, make some assumptions. Hopefully those are conservative assumptions and we move from there. Yeah, definitely. Touching a bit more on the uncertainty and how how we kind of cope with it. A lot of firms, obviously, either due to historical or structural reasons, have, have an investment committee uh, that approves investments. And in our last kind of chat, you spoke about the importance of one person making the final investment decision. Do you think that there is a way that one can sharpen the workings of an IC or some more bureaucratic structure like that? Or applying Munger's principles of inversion, what are the worst mistakes that any investment committee can make? Well, if you look at if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, and Warren brought in these two managers, Todd and Ted, under him, so he made it very clear to them that they never need to run any idea past him. They've got full independence to to invest in anything. The only time he's ex he's I think asked them to run stuff by him is it just to make sure there's nothing else going on where Berkshire is buying the whole company or something, and you know they. They might be tripping some laws or something. But other than that, basically, they do their thing. And in fact, the degree of autonomy is so extreme that I think each of them last I knew they were managing about 15 billion each. The autonomy is so extreme that Warren said that he did not care if they put it all into one idea. So basically, he said if, if Todd had decided that the entire 15 billion should go into one stock, he would not have anything to say about that. So that's the degree of autonomy gave, gave them. And I think that that's the correct approach. I think that anything else that you do, which basically takes away from the independence of the manager is going to do more harm than good, in my opinion. When, when I was investing in Turkey, if there was any kind of investment committee they would not ever get to consensus. You know, there'd be a thousand reasons to say no. And, uh, and so you never get fired or used to never get fired for buying IBM. And, and so a investment committee would go along the seven biggest stocks in the S&P 500. You know, they would be completely flavor of the day because that's where they see comfort and they, that's where they see that they can be fired and all of that. So... So I think that independence of thought is important, but also Buffett and Munger have had a very 
a difficult time finding good managers. It is easier to find good investments than investment managers. And it is very difficult to identify someone who is likely in the future to be a great investment manager. So you need thread marks to help you get there. But you also need them young enough so they have a runway. So there's a, there's kind of a balance between the two where you need to see that there's enough history that the person has and enough runway in the future. And and even then, it's it's a judgment call because it could have been the environment or particular stocks or something else that caused that. And so identifying great investment managers is not an easy task. Absolutely. At this point, we have we have some questions about uh, Dakshin now. So I guess we can segue to those. So we'd love to hear a little bit more generally about kind of kind of the work you do, when it was set up, kind of why. And after that, I think we'll get into kind of how the investment and capital allocation decisions are made there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the investing business is such that if you're even slightly above average, basically you're going to end up quite wealthy, well beyond what I think would bring you more happiness in terms of consumption. So I, I, I realized probably, I would say close to 20 years ago, maybe 18 years ago, that we would end up with significantly more wealth than we could consume. And, and there was nothing we could do that would increase happiness by increasing consumption. So the wealth would be just extra. And there's only two things you can do with extra wealth. You can give it to your gene pool or you can recycle it back to society or some combination of the two. And, you know, I would say that giving it to your gene pool, if the, if the amounts are really large, will do more harm than good. And But I think giving your kids or grandkids a little bit of a kind of jumpstart in life is a good idea. And so what we had done is that we used to, in the US, we had these UGMA accounts and gifting laws where we could give, you know, now we can give about 17,000 or so per person to a person each year tax-free. And we did that for both our kids when they were very young. And and I, I invested that money in a, quite a concentrated manner. And the thing about these UGMA accounts is that they get full control when they are 18. Which, which is exactly what I wanted. I didn't want to actually be having any controls of the business after they are controls of the money after they were adults. And because of because these funds were concentrated, it became a good size sub fund, you know, single digit millions, but a few million. And both my daughters, when they turned 18, they basically gave me power of attorney to keep managing those funds. And, and subsequently they've, utilize some of the funds and I think they've been utilized in a good way. I think they've they've used it to start a business, they've used it to fund higher ed and and different things. So it's been it's been wonderful. It's ex- exactly significantly exceeded my expectations. So that took care of you know basically the gene pool and you know they know that there's nothing else coming and they they actually don't want anything else. So then you know when you recycle back to society, uh, I wanted I wanted that the the social return on invested capital should be really high, so that the benefit to society is very high. And unfortunately, most charitable organizations or NGOs, etc., don't really think in that way. You know, someone has some pet project or whatever they like and. They don't really look at, okay, what is the input and output and what happens here? And sometimes we run into organizations which have, you know, large fundraisers and they'll spend 80% of the money raised in raising funds. You know, so if I gave a dollar, 80 cents just disappears in the act of raising the funds, which is terrible and uh, doesn't really go to the cause. And so I wanted to... I wanted to find an organization I could fund that was just great at social return on invested capital. And when we were setting up the Dakshina Foundation in 2005, 2000, I looked high and low 
And I was very disappointed. I really couldn't find an organization that really thought about these things in the right manner. And uh, then I ran into this guy in Bihar in India who ran Super 30, which is basically taking 30 very poor kids and training them for a year and helping, helping them get into IIT. The return on that was off the charts. And I wanted to fund him. You know, I said, hey, Anand, this is really great. Let's take 30 to 300. And I'll write you a check. I'm not going to ask you anything. You have full autonomy. Do whatever you want. And he said, I don't want any outside money. And I don't want to scale. And I want to just keep doing what I'm doing. And I tried very hard to convince him. I went and met him, et cetera, but he wouldn't budge. So since I'm the shameless cloner, I asked him if he had any objections that if I cloned him. And he said, no, he, he thinks that's a great idea. He would try to support us and anything he could help us with. And so I said, okay, this model is really good. I don't really want to do it, but this guy won't do it. I don't have anyone else who can do it. So I'll give it a shot. And my expectation was that we would fall flat and fail. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy who hangs out in, the, in shorts at that time in California, now in Austin. And this was going to be a, you know, endeavor, you know, looking at rural India and all of that. But what ended up happening is that first we were cloning a great model. Secondly, I lucked out big time and some really great people showed up. They literally showed up at my doorstep. And uh, we ended up with great leadership. And I was happy to leave them alone. And they would, they would, all the different leaders we've had at Dakshana, and they've been very good, they keep bringing up different tangents and uh, initiatives and things that we could do. And my job is always to just say no. You know, so that's the biggest value I added is that whatever they'd come up with, I just say, I'd look at it and say, okay, how does this compare to our core model? And it doesn't compare that well. And so it's a, taking a pass. And, and so the focus has helped us a lot and it's worked out really well. And I think it's been, been great. Yeah. So one of the initiatives we've recently kind of set up is kind of uh, our first live fund at, at the Oxford Alpha Fund. So progressing from a society to kind of actually managing money. And on the back end, we're definitely interested in kind of allocating cash returns to charitable causes so as to not become asset accumulators. Um, and so one of the things we were curious about with respect to Dakshana was how do you assess the social return on invested capital? Um, like what kind of data points are you looking at and how are you uh, kind of teasing out downstream effects uh, of the impact you have to assess these things? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in Dakshana's case, it was extremely easy to see that. So when I looked at the Super 30 model, you know, he was taking 30 kids in for, for a year. A lot of these kids came from really the absolute bottom of society in the sense that the income, the household income was like $40 a month or less or $20 a month was really low. And Anand provided free room and board to them for a year. His mother used to cook for them. And, and so these 30 kids, basically, when I uh, looked at the economics of what Anand was doing, it was costing him about... $800 per kid for the one year of prep, you know, both the room and board and coaching and everything. He was himself taking the math classes and he had hired faculty for physics and chemistry. So it was $800 a, a year. When, when these kids got into IIT and he had a 90 to 100% success rate, so really high success rate. When these kids got to IIT, the IITs are so heavily subsidized. So if there was no government subsidy, an IIT education would cost around $60,000 over four years, sixty dollars or $70,000 over four years, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand 20000 a year. Because the government subsidy is so high, the, the cost of attending the IITs is basically about... I think uh, it's about what about four or five lakhs or what, twenty lakhs. It's about uh, maybe less than about ten thousand uh, dollars a year. I mean, ten thousand dollars in all, maybe about more like uh, two or three thousand um, dollars a year because of the government subsidy. 
and even that two, three, four thousand dollars that is being paid by the student, every IIT has a State Bank of India branch inside the IIT. And the State Bank of India is a state-owned bank that has a mandate to give student loans. So if you basically get admitted to IIT, you can just walk into the State Bank and they'll just give you a loan for the entire amount that you're on the hook for. And there are many other banks that will give loans to IITs, and there are many scholarships and grants and everything else that's available. So at Dakshina, we've, we've sent thousands of kids to IIT. We've never had to really step in to help them with tuition or anything. I think it's the ecosystem is very well developed. So in effect, the cost of attending an IIT is basically free. Now, when you graduate, the size of the student loan is so low because of this heavy subsidy that when you start working, the savings rate is pretty high. And I think in probably like two, three, four years, the kids can easily pay off all their loans and have a lot of savings beyond that. In fact, I think they could, in many cases, pay off their loans in a year or two completely because of the huge income that they're getting relative to the loans. So because this this huge government subsidy, because the IITs get you connected to the global economy, and because multinationals are coming to hire from the IITs and all of that, the input-output ratio of the $800, so basically the only thing that's really going out of pocket is the $800. The rest is all funded. You, you spend $800,000 on someone, and they come out the other end, and they have a job in India which is paying you know, $15,000 a year, which would be equivalent to about 70, 80,000 elsewhere. And, and such, it's just a no brainer. And now at Dakshina, we don't have the cost equation that Anand had. It costs us about $3,000 a person, not 800, because, you know, we have a kitchen staff and not my mom cooking. My mom's passed away and, and such. But so our costs are higher. But it's industrial scale. You know, we're we're graduating a thousand kids a year versus three thirty kids, and uh, so the input output ratio of the three thousand dollars going in to what's happening on the other end. We we have kids who are now you know maybe eight or nine years out of school. They're working at Google and so on, and their compensation is over a million dollars a year. One of our alums has got like a team of twenty engineers under him and is moving very fast. And so we've had several of them who get who got funded by top top end VCs. They dropped out of IIT and they got funded and so on. So I think that the, the bell curve on the output coming out from the kids that we've taken in is just truly off the chart. So it's, it was uh, easy to see that this model is great. And it's when we compare it to other models, because of that huge government subsidy, just hard to compare it. Yeah, really interesting. Definitely a no-brainer. Can you give us some examples of like extensions or like other projects that people on staff have come to you with that you said no to because they didn't meet that hurdle? Well, we we will we will we will need to find other other initiatives in the next few years. So this particular model that we are running will run out of IIT seats and will run out of medical seats. Basically, currently Dakshina is spending about $3 million a year and we're pushing, putting out about a thousand kids a year. When we, when we are spending about seven or $8 million a year and maybe graduating about 3000 kids a year. So the IITs take a total of 16,000 kids a year. Okay, we are already taking a significant number of IIT seats. I don't think Dakshina will ever be able to really take more than 10% or 12% of the total IIT seats available. It's a very competitive place. There's a lot of rich people. In some cases, the coaching starts six years before the kid finishes high school in sixth grade for that IIT uh, coaching, whereas we are doing two years or one year. So it's very competitive. So I don't think we can, once we are processing about 3000 kids a year through our program, we will max out. And that's a high class problem. 
And so once we hit that seven to eight million, we'll have to look at plan B. What do we do for plan B? And I've experimented with a few things which so far have not panned out. We've looked at going further. So India's public education system for elementary school and middle school and high school and so on is quite pathetic. The funding levels are low and the quality is low. We've looked at going into some of these schools in some kind of a magnet type of situation where we do something similar to what we're doing, but we found it difficult to really make those equations work. The, the model, the one model that looks very appealing to me is there's another, there's another charity. And if I, I don't know whether they existed when Dakshana came about, but if I knew about them at that time, I would have just written them a check and been done with it. There's another a nonprofit called Akshay Patra. Some of you might have heard of it. And what Akshay Patra does is it provides hot midday meals for kids in government schools in India. So the Indian government many years back basically mandated that these government schools had to provide a hot midday meal. And the reason they did that was that they felt that if the ultra poor families knew that their kids would get one good meal at a school, they would send their kids to school. And so it would tackle the huge illiteracy problem in India because of the carrot of the midday meal. So the government set up this whole midday meal program, which was a really good program. And so at a given school, the government will tell the school, look, we'll, we'll pay you 50 cents or 75 cents per kid. And you, you give out contracts to providers who can provide that midday meal. So a bunch of kind of for-profit companies came about and what would happen is that there was a lot of corruption. So they would bribe the school officials and then the food would be terrible. And then, you know, people are skimming off the top. What Akshay Patra did is they came in and said, and they're a nonprofit. They said, you can give us the 50 cents that the government is giving you. We're gonna put another 50 cents from our side. So instead of trying to make money on that 50 cents, like, you know, 20 cents or 30 cents of that going disappearing into all these middlemen, they said that the meal's actually going to be a $1 meal. And it's a very high quality meal. And the second thing they did was they set up these industrial scale kitchens. So these very large kitchens, which are servicing 50 schools. And they set up a network of these delivery vans and all of that. So they did it on a very large industrial scale. And even at the large industrial scale, they spent much more than what they were getting paid. So their expenditures per kid for the quality of meal provided, if any for-profit company was doing that, it might be $2 or $3 per, per meal. And we went and looked at Akshay Patra's kitchens. And we actually took a bunch of cloning ideas from them and incorporated them in our kitchens because they were so good. You know, like they had they had come up with very efficient ways to steam rice and different industrial scale things they had done. And so in that particular case, we don't have this in, you know, the Dakshina model measures amount we spend versus income of the kids that are coming out, right? In the Akshay Patra model, what is very obvious to us is that the kids are getting a very, very nutritious meal. And we also know that the literacy rates have climbed quite significantly deep in rural India in the hinterlands when these kids used to be child labor, you know, working in the fields and such. So to me, at the back of my head, I always have the Akshay Patra model. So once we hit 7 million, if we don't come up with a better model than Akshay Patra or Dakshina, we'll go to Akshay Patra. Now, I think the problem they may be having is they may be hitting upper limits too. So they have grown a lot. They've expanded in many different parts of India. 
I just love, I've, I've met their management teams. I've met the people who support them. Just, it's just a great group. It's the same DNA that Dakshina has. They think the same way. They think about social return and investor capital. It's such a breath of fresh air. But we are the only two players who think like this. And that's it. There's just the two of us. So that's where we are at. Well, I mean, Monish, that was just like exceptional to hear. Like, I'm really, we're really just so inspired by like, you know, the thinking that goes into the charitable endeavors that you do. And it's just so dynamic. And I think that's what really makes this job worth doing, right? You gain capital and you can give it back to others and really share it with others and lift other people. Yeah, I had, I had expected, I had expected with Dakshina that we would fall flat on our face. I expected mm -hmm. 10 years, 15 years of just falling flat, paying the tuition bill and then learning how we can do this. We got traction in a few weeks. And, and really, I think now the best days of the year have been the days I spent with the Dakshina scholars, visiting their homes and all of that. The, the impact has blown me away. And I think the main reason has been that these, the team that has come together is way more passionate about Dakshina than I am. I mean, they, they own it so much more than I do. And so they think it's their baby and it's worked out really 100x better than I ever thought of. So it's been awesome to watch. I completely agree. And I just hope it keeps compounding and compounding and really generating more and more like great results for these kids. And I mean, thank you. This has been such a dynamic discussion. You've learned so much and like, it's always great to speak with you. And I guess in closing, is there maybe, let's say one piece of advice you would give to students, like to people, you know, 20, 30 years younger, but not just looking for a career in investing, but you've seen so much in life through both Dakshina, through the Pub Rai Fund, through your career. And if there's one thing you could leave them with, maybe something to your 22 year old self. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that one of the things that happens with students and especially when they're looking at, you know, careers and companies to join, et cetera, a lot of them focus on the big brands you know, and what would, what would make people envious, you know, mm -hmm. and, and actually that's a wrong model. I think that the Buffett model is a much better model. You focus on going to work for people you like, admire, and trust. The second mm -hmm. is try as early as possible in life to find what you're passionate about. If you are so lucky as to, you know, I found investing when I was an old man of 30, okay? If you are so lucky to know what you are really passionate about when you're at Oxford or before you graduate or even right after you graduate, that's a huge positive. And once you figure that out, go all in. Go an inch wide and a mile deep into your passion. And if you do that, you will just blow the doors off. Okay, that's, I, that's amazing. I think that's really the best note that we can end this uh, short chat and like talk on, like an inch wide and a mile deep. And that's really like where you want to be. All right, well, thank you so much for your time, Monish. This is like amazing, like this for us to hear. And I've always been a big fan of your work. And so I mean, the chance to just talk to you and to, to hear what you, you have to share. It's been really incredible. Thank you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Manish. And uh, we'll definitely speak soon. And have a great day ahead. Yeah, and speak soon. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll